Hi everyone, in this video we are going to recap our understanding of protein synthesis. Remember that when you see the word synthesis that means making something. So in this case we're going to be talking about how we make proteins. So we're going to do three things. The first thing is we're going to recall the structure of DNA and the job, the role of DNA. The second thing we're going to do is look at the stages involved in synthesizing or making a protein and then we're going to apply that to understanding how a mutation or change in the DNA base sequence might lead to a non-functioning protein. In other words, a protein that's unable to do its job. The first thing to remember is that DNA structure is made up of three things. There is a phosphate backbone, as you can see here in this orange colour. There are sugars attached to the backbone and attached to the sugars are four possible bases. Now we're going to focus our attention on the bases because the bases are essentially what make up the genetic code. So the order or the sequence of bases determines what the protein will be. More specifically and more importantly, the shape of the protein. So the order of the bases is what we're going to focus on. So in this diagram, you can see a section of DNA called a gene. We can see the very specific order of the bases, and we can see how that specific order of the bases determines the order of something called amino acids, and then ultimately the shape and the structure of the protein. So that's the really big idea. Why does that matter? Well, proteins are really, really important in all living things. Take one example that we've looked at before, which is enzymes. Enzymes are essential for catalyzing, so speeding up the reactions inside our cells. Without enzymes, we wouldn't be able to survive. And more specifically, it's the active site of the enzyme, which is where the substrate binds that is important. The shape of the active site is specific to the enzyme because the substrate must be complementary to it and fit inside it. If the shape of the active site changes, then the substrate will no longer fit and the enzyme will no longer work. In other words, the protein, the enzyme, will no longer be functioning. So the shape of proteins is absolutely essential. So what happens to actually make these proteins in the first place? So I'm going to show you the general order then I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the order and then we're going to check our understanding and look at some examples. So first of all, we start with our molecule called DNA, which holds that genetic code. It holds the specific sequence of bases. DNA is first copied into a template called RNA. RNA then determines a very specific order or sequence of amino acids. And that very specific sequence of amino acids determines the protein, more specifically the shape of the protein. Now alongside this, we also know that DNA can undergo mutations, that's changes in that base sequence. So given what we've just said, if the order of the bases changes, in other words, there's a mutation, then that means the protein shape might also change. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. So how does this happen? How do we synthesize or make proteins? So first of all, we're going to draw our attention to the nucleus of the cell. The nucleus of the cell is where the DNA is stored. So first of all, inside the nucleus, we take our DNA strand, our section of DNA called a gene. Now, DNA is a really important molecule. We don't want to damage it in any way. So instead of just taking that section of DNA called a gene and making a protein directly from it, we first make a template strand. And that template strand is made of a molecule called RNA. Now, RNA is very similar to DNA, and you'll learn more about this in A-level biology, but you don't need to know the details of it now. So it's a little bit like when you do your exam papers in your, in your GCSEs, you wouldn't send your um, exam paper to lots of different examiners to mark. The examiner will make a copy of your exam paper because it's a very important document. We need to make sure that that original stays as it is. So what they'll do is they'll make copies of it and they'll send the copies out to the examiners just in case it gets damaged. The same thing happens with our DNA. 
Our DNA is really precious. We need to make sure it doesn't get damaged. So what we do is we make a template of it, and that template is in the form of RNA. So the RNA then moves out of the nucleus, and it moves to an organelle or a subcellular structure called a ribosome, which you should remember from year nine. Now, the ribosome is where protein synthesis takes place. So if you're asked, where does protein synthesis take place? You always say the ribosome, not the nucleus. The ribosome is the exact location. So this RNA attaches to the ribosome and the RNA is read a little bit like a book. The RNA is read by the ribosome and the way it's read is very specific. So rather than reading the whole code in one go, the ribosome splits the code into three bases. So the ribosome reads every three bases and we call each of those three bases a triplet or a codon. And each of those three bases is important because each three bases or each triplet each code for a specific amino acid. I want you to think back to looking at digestion in year 10. We learnt that when we digest proteins from our food, those proteins break down into amino acids. So therefore, that tells us that if we add lots of amino acids together, we'll probably make a protein. And that's what was going to happen here. So the ribosome reads each of these three bases or triplets. And each of those triplets codes for a specific amino acid. Now, the amino acids are not right there next to the ribosome ready to go. They have to be carried to the ribosome. So a carrier molecule goes and collects the correct amino acid and it brings it along. Then the ribosome reads the next three bases or the next codon. And the carrier molecule brings the next amino acid along. And those two amino acids are bonded together. The ribosome keeps reading across each of these triplets or codons until it gets to the end of the RNA. Each time a new amino acid is brought to the ribosome and a new bond is formed. So what we end up with is a long chain of amino acids in a very specific order or sequence, ultimately leading to a protein. Now, actually, a lot of our DNA, around 98.5% is non-coding. That means that it doesn't actually code for a protein. So what does it do? Well, there are four things that it does. Some of it's just junk. Some of it you can learn more about at A-level. Some of it is due to viruses. But the most important one that we need to know about is the fact that some of this non-coding DNA actually switches genes on and off. For example, if you are a nerve cell, you don't need to make insulin. Therefore, you would switch that gene off because you don't need to you don't need to use any energy up making insulin because you're a nerve cell. Equally, if you are a nerve cell, you don't need to contract and relax. So you might switch the genes off that allow you to do that. Let's check our understanding. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. You need to pause the video and you need to choose the correct answer from one, two, three or four. Pause the video now and choose your answer. OK, let's see what, how we did. So we should have recognised that DNA is the very, very starting molecule. We then need to make a template strand called RNA. RNA then codes for a specific sequence of amino acids, which leads to a specific shape protein. If you didn't get that right, make sure you go back in the video and listen to my explanation again. Next question. Pause the video now and restart when you've got your answer. OK, let's check our answer. We should have got number one. Next question. Pause the video now and restart when you've chosen your answer. We should have said number three. We can also remember call that a triplet or a codon, and you do need to know those two words. Next question. Pause the video now and choose your answer. 
OK, we should have said the ribosome. Be careful that you don't say the nucleus, although the DNA is stored in the nucleus. The DNA, once it's turned into RNA, actually moves out of the nucleus and it's on the ribosomes where the actual protein synthesis takes place. So be careful with that question. Next question. Pause the video now. Restart when you've got your answer. So we should have said a carrier molecule. Remember, the RNA is being read by the ribosome. We're making a protein, so we're never using proteins in this situation, we're just making them. It is the carrier molecule that goes and collects the correct amino acid. Next question. Pause the video when you've read the options and choose your correct answer and restart when you're ready to check. We should have chosen number three. Remember, if we change a base sequence, we will change the amino acid sequence, therefore change the protein shape. Think about the enzyme. If its active site shape changes, then that means that it's not going to fit with the substrate and it will not work. It will be non-functioning. Next question. Pause the video and restart when you've chosen your answer. So we should have said number two. Remember that even though some bits of DNA are non-coding, so they don't code for a protein, they can still do a really important job, which is deciding which genes get switched on and switched off. Think about the nerve cell example. It would be switching off the gene for insulin because it doesn't need to make it. Or it might switch off the gene for being able to contract and relax because it just doesn't need to be able to do that as a nerve cell. So let's now try and apply this to some examples. So the most common thing that you'll be asked is to explain how a mutation might change how a protein functions. I'm going to give you some time to read that question and I'm going to show you the model answer. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look at the context of the question and you're going to say what's happening to that particular protein in the particular example. So the first thing you would say is what is the disease? The disease is cystic fibrosis. What is it causing or caused by? A mutation. But where is the mutation? The mutation is in the base sequence which codes for this specific protein, CFTR. So we're going to use the exact context from the question to show the examiner that you can apply it to that context. Then the next part should be the same for every question. So once we've applied it to that specific context in sentence one, then what we're going to do is we're going to be very general and we're going to use this every time we answer this question. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say what will happen once that mutation has happened. Well, all mutations will cause a change in the triplet code. In other words, the three bases. What does that mean? It means that you will get the wrong amino acid or you might say a different amino acid. What's the consequence of that? Well, if the amino acid sequence is wrong, then the protein will have a different shape and it will no longer carry out its function. Let's have a look at one again, and this time you're going to pause the video and you're going to have a go at this one on your own. You can go back and rewind if you want to look at my model answer again. Restart the video when you've written your answer down. So let's check our answer. So we should have first part where we're linking the context to our own answer. In this case, osteogenesis is the disease. What's it caused by? A mutation again, but this time a different protein called collagen. That should be specific to the context in the question. The next part should be the same. It should be the same as the previous answer in my model. That changes the triplet code. It means a different or wrong amino acid is used, and that in turn means there's a different shape. Let's do one more example. Again, pause the video and restart when you've written down your answer. OK, let's check our answer. So again, the first part is specific to the question, in this case, haemophilia and a protein called gene factor number eight. The second part should be the same and the third part should be the same. If you feel like you need some more practice with this, let your teacher know and we can give you some more examples or we can try and explain it again. Thanks for listening.